Today is the third Sunday after Easter, and that's uh, good to be here again in Denver. In the epistle, it's also the feast of the exaltation of the uh, finding of the cross by St. Helena. And today, the epistle for this um, third Sunday after Easter, taken from the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 2. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to refrain yourselves from carnal desires which war against the soul, having your conversation good among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by the good works which they shall behold in you glorify God in the day of visitation. Be ye subject therefore to every human creature for God's sake, whether it be to the king as excelling or to the governor as is sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of the good. So is the will of God, that by doing well, you may put to his silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not as making liberty a cloak for malice. But as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, for this is thankworthy in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Gospel, taken by the court of St. John, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, A little while and, and now, and you shall still not see me. Again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said one to another, What is this that he said to us, A little while, and you shall not see me? Again, a little while, and you shall see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he said, A little while? We know not what he speaketh. And Jesus knew that they had a mind to talk to ask him. And he said to them, Of this do you inquire amongst yourselves? Because I said, Little while, and you shall not see me. And again, Little while, and you shall see me. Because I men and men, I say to you, That you shall lament and weep, but the world shall rejoice. And you shall be made sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, hath sorrow. Because... Her hour is come, but when, they, when she hath brought forth the child, she remembereth no more than anguish, but for joy that a man is come into the world, born into the world. So also you now indeed have sorrow, but I will rise, see, see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man shall take from you. That's for the words of today's holy gospel. Oh, that's only goes to men. St. Augustine says that during this time of these 40 days between Christmas and the Easter and the Ascension, Christ was not wasting his time. He was busy teaching. He was busy instructing and strengthening his apostles for a war that would last until the ending of time. And one of the points that's made out here, we have the rule number 10 of the Ignatian Retreat of the first week. That one who is in consolation should take care and see how he will conduct himself in the desolation that will follow. But when we have consolation, we must may have strength. We must, we must strengthen ourselves and be ready for the next day of the fight. But usually when there's consolation, everything is wasted. Such as the day when those three apostles went with St. Peter, James, and John, on, uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter, James, and John, went to the command of the Transfiguration. They said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And that is completely the wrong answer, the wrong question, the wrong statement. It is not good for us to be here. It is good to work out the will of God. It is good to spread His kingdom. It is good to carry Christ to the ends of the earth. It is not good to be on top of a mountain seeing a vision. And they wasted their consolation. And that consolation, which probably lasted around three hours, was to strengthen them for a desolation that would follow. And that desolation would follow during the agony in the garden. And if only they had remembered the conversation of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ that he had with Moses and with Elias. He was speaking about his passion. He was speaking about the work of redemption. And they were not listening to what Moses and Elias and Christ had to say. They were not benefiting from that consolation. They were not ready when the battle came. God did not want them to be crucified. He did not want them to die. This was not their time. 
He didn't even want them to have the smallest physical harm. He just wanted them to stay awake for an hour and comfort Christ. That's all he wanted. And they were exhausted. And they were spiritually exhausted. They were physically exhausted. They were emotionally exhausted. And they were not able to stay awake for that hour. But if only they had remembered the transfiguration. They would have had the strength to understand and to be able to persevere through that holy hour. But they did not. And so there is a consolation that is given by God and it is to strengthen us. And this consolation is often wasted. But then there is another consolation. Little consolations that are given by the devil. And these are also spoken to, spoken of by, our, by St. Ignatius in his exercise in the rules of the second week. That sometimes there's a temptation under the appearance of good. Where something seems good in the beginning, it seems good in the middle, but at the end it somehow turns bad. It doesn't make us go better. And so the question about the consolation that comes from the devil is to be asked, does this consolation, does this comfort, does this make me stronger? Does it make me go closer to God? Does it say I have done enough? Does it say I should do more? What is this consolation? There are consolations which come to us and say, we are doing our part, and we have done enough, and we are still good. And these consolations most likely come from the devil. And then there are consolations that come to say, you know what, God's going to give you strength, and there is hope, and you can persevere, and you can do better, and you can continue. And these consolations most likely come from God. What do we do with consolations during these days of the 40 days after Easter, our Lord was going around and speaking to the apostles and strengthening them for a battle to come. And then the battle comes, they were to, to take it, they were to, to fight with great confidence. And today is an interesting feast, the Feast of St. Helena, a wonderful day in which she found the mother of Constantine, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at that time, it was, it was, it was, it, her, her son was the emperor. And he became the emperor in the year 320, 313, he became the emperor. And it's interesting, one of the great bishops, the great bishop of the Arian crisis, his name was Athanasius. And he was born in the year 292. When he was born and was a little boy, in the year 302, when he was 10 years old, there began a great persecution. The greatest persecution that's ever happened in the history of the church of the first 300 years. And the little boy Athanasius would have known many friends and priests, and his relatives that were all killed by Diocletian, the massive martyrdom, and the complete eradication, and churches that had been built by Diocletian were ripped down and destroyed, and there was an utterly horrible persecution. And it went on until he was about, at about 20 years old. And the 20-year-old Athanasius, a 20-year-old young man becoming a deacon in the church, he only knew death, and he only knew the persecution of the church, and there was bloodshed everywhere. And he could not imagine that in a few years there will be a council of Nicaea. Only 12 years later, there will be a council in Nicaea, and the emperor would call the council, the very emperor that is bringing about the death of all the Catholics, and just trying to eradicate the entire church in the greatest persecution ever, with a with million Catholics dying. Now, all the great martyrs dying, and the churches ripped down, was there any hope? And what happened? A cross appeared in the sky. In this sign you shall conquer, it said. And Constantine, whose mother was a secret Catholic, and Constantine saw the sign. He did not believe in the religion of Christ, but he saw the sign, and he put that sign on the shields of his soldiers, and he went into battle, and it defeated his enemies. And then he was baptized a Catholic the next year, and he made an edict of Milan, stating that all, all the religion of the church is going to be no longer ever persecuted again in Rome. And the Catholic church began to immediately flourish. In the year 311, this was unimaginable. In the year 312, it was completely unimaginable. Because now that Diocletian had died in insanity, and he had the three most wicked... Like a, a, Tetrarchs following him, and the young Constantine, what was he going to be like? But he had no power. He was coming down from Gaul. He was coming down from France. He was the weakest of the four Tetrarchs, and the other three were going to continue the policies of Diocletian and completely wipe out Christianity. But that 
well, that tetrarch came down and he fought the Battle of Milvian Bridge and he defeated Galerius, Maxentius, and later Galerius and the other one, wiped them out. And immediately he sent soldiers into the catacombs and they captured the Pope, St. Sylvester. And Sylvester thought when they came, Sylvester was about to celebrate Mass and his priests and, his, and deacons were around him. The soldiers are coming. We are now going to be martyred. And the soldiers came in. And they said, are you, Sylvester? Are you the Bishop of Rome? Yes, I am. The emperor wants to see you. And they brought him to the emperor, and he thought he was going to be put to death. But instead, the emperor inquired to him about the Catholic faith. And the emperor was instructed by St. Sylvester, and then he was baptized by St. Sylvester. And then he built the Church of St. Peter's in Rome. And he built the other, many of the other seven basilicas, including the Basilica of the Holy Cross of Jerusalem. And he built... The holy churches in Rome, and he guided, he became a Catholic and a firm Catholic. No one could imagine this happening. Now imagine those people in, the, in, the, in those years not knowing that it was a final persecution. There have been nine great persecutions before, and this was the tenth. Just like there were nine plagues, and there was a tenth. And they did not understand that this one would be the final one. They did not be told by, by God. They weren't told by the saints. Would you persevere? And those who persevered through this persecution, they become the fire. And they became the strength of the Catholic Church. The young Athanasius, the deacon, thought he would be martyred for the faith. And he almost was. And he thought he would die at the hands of wicked men. And he almost did. And he thought he would have to run in exile. And he did have to run in exile. But his exile was caused by the Pope. And not by the king, like he thought it would be when he was young. He was, had to flee from his fellow bishops. He had to flee from his fellow Catholics. He had, he had to deal with the Arian crisis so that after there was a glory of the church and immediately the Arian heresy came in. Now we are in similar times right now. And this is not a time to compromise. Open your eyes and see. What did our Lord Jesus Christ say? He said, when you see them talk of wars and rumors of wars... When you hear peace, peace, and there is no peace. When there are earthquakes and great tribulations in many places. When you see the persecution happening throughout the world. Lift up your eyes and see that your redemption is at hand. Athanasius did not know he would become a bishop of Alexandria. And that he would be the, probably the, 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 the second visible bishop of Alexandria. The bishops before were all in hiding for the first 300 years. And he would be able to be the public bishop of Alexandria. And then he had to be fought, he had to be driven out many times. And he would be the one stating that creed, the Athanasian creed, for all of us Catholics to recite. And to know that we follow that creed that was held faithfully for without trouble for 300 years of persecution. And then when persecution ended, heretics came to try to destroy the church. And Athanasius, who was ready to die a martyr as a boy, at the hand of Diocletian, he then was ready to die a martyr at the hand of Liberius the Pope. And the dire martyr at the hand of his fellow bishops. And the dire martyr at the hand of his fellow priests. For him there was no change. The faith must be stood for in the, every single type of circumstance and every situation. And we must understand right now. This is not the time to play games of compromise. It is not the time. Those who have find themselves in the state of compromise now. They were going to be embarrassed when the time of the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary comes. We have a wicked attack called the Novus Ordo Mise, the New Mass. The New Mass is a double-edged sword, and the Vatican II is a double-edged sword. The New Mass came, and they threw out the Old Mass, and they destroyed the altars, and they destroyed everything, and they set up a new church. And millions and millions of Catholics left the church. And then what happened? The New Mass became a double-edged sword, because it did two things. One, it said, who goes to this Mass accepts the errors and heresies of Vatican II. And the second edge of the sword, whoever is against this Mass, and whoever doesn't want this Novus Ordo Mise, is a friend of God. And that is the deception. Because whoever is against the new Mass is not necessarily the friend of God. And whoever tries to diminish the new mass is not necessarily the friend of God, because our fight is of faith and not of sacred liturgy. How many times have the saints of the church, St. Francis Xavier, 
was able to I had many times where he had to travel for days and weeks and sometimes months without ever having to being able to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. A priest of God unable to celebrate the Mass. How many times did St. Peter go from place to place and be unable to celebrate the Mass? But St. Peter was never a moment without his holy faith and he, he died for his holy faith. And St. Paul in prison was not able to celebrate the Holy Mass. And so it is, and, we, and he was in prison for two years. How often was he able to celebrate the Holy Mass? But he always kept his holy faith, and he said, this is what's going to conquer Satan. So now we have the double-edged sword. And the second part of the edge is being most vicious and most effective right now. And that is a false conservative movement. We are seeing right now the same kind of reaction that we saw in the 70s. And we saw in the 80s, you know, it's a terrible thing that they've gone with the new mass. It's a terrible thing that they pulled the altar away from the wall. But my priest, he's keeping the altar up against the wall. It's a terrible thing they've turned the altar around. But my priest, he will not turn the altar around. It's a terrible thing that they have had lay ministers. But my priest will not have lay ministers. It's a terrible thing that they have handed out Holy Communion in the hand. But my priests and his lay ministers, they will never hand out Communion in the hand. And it never stops. And then we go back to the way it should be. Like the very good conservative priest in Kentucky who said, I'm going to bring it back the way it should be. I'm going to celebrate the new Mass. And I'm going to make sure that Communion is given only on the tongue. And I will only allow the sisters to give out Holy Communion, and religious to give out Holy Communion, but not regular lay people. Isn't that wonderful? No, it is not. The good priest is put into a trap for receiving sacrilegious Holy Communion kneeling is only slightly better than the received sacrilegious Holy Communion standing, which is only slightly better than receiving sacrilegious Holy Communion in the hand. All three are sacrilegious Holy Communions because they are communions coming from the abomination of the Novus Ordo Mise. Each one of them is offensive to God. And, they, are, and they, they, they cry to heaven for vengeance. And many good souls are being trapped by this false return. So right now, for instance, we are hearing good stories. Good stories about the coronavirus. We are going to stand up against the coronavirus. My beloved brother had a protest mass today. <laughs> Big protest. So there are over 50 people in front of St. Isidore's. It's a secret. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> there were 50 people in the, in, the, in the cars outside of St. Isidore's. And they were not allowed to go in the church because only nine people could go in the church. And But they're able to see through the doors. They're able to attend the Mass. And what is what are those who did these things? They are a pariah. <laughs> they are unacceptable. Because they tried to go to Mass. They called the governor. They called the police. They called the Arapahoe County. They, they spoke to the superior generals. They went through all the channels. Does this sound familiar? How many Catholics in the last 40 years? I'm going to talk to the bishop of the diocese. We're going to write a letter, a campaign letter. We're going to bring the Latin Mass into our parishes. We're going to get rid of communion in the hand. We're going to remove Father Bob. Because Father Bob is the most wicked priest in the world. And we're going to get rid of Father Bob. we got a campaign. We got rid of Father Bob. And Father Bob is a terrible padre. The other padres are good. This padre is crazy, and that padre is better. And now they're saying, this society priest is good, and that society priest is liberal, and this one is nice, and that one is mean, and this one is holy, and that one is not. Turns out that Solomon is quite right. There's nothing new under the sun. And the more things change, the more they remain the same. We are fighting the wrong battle and fighting in the wrong battlefield. And so we're going to write to our congressman and make sure we get permission to say that they, like in Kentucky, they have, they have allowed the abortion clinic. The only thing that can be open in Kentucky is the abortion clinic. And then last month, 115 people died. They claimed the coronavirus. Well, they didn't die from it, but at least they wrote their names down as they died from it. And there are more than 550 abortions. And in many of those abortions, and the only abortion clinic in Kentucky, in Louisville, Kentucky, the only one abortion clinic remains, and that, and that clinic is open for business. No face masks, no social distancing, 
And they all go, and the people go to the place, the people that went have the girls that had their abortions came from Kentucky, but they also came from Tennessee, and they also came from Ohio, and they also came from Indiana, and the governor said, you shouldn't cross the borders and go back again, unless, of course, you're going to have an abortion. Then there's no problem. So there are those fighting against it. You have rights to have an abortion, why can't we have rights to have our mass? And there are protests in front of the... Uh, in front of the courthouses and protests in front of the governor's offices. Isn't that encouraging? No. It is a deception and a lie from the devil. They are fighting the wrong fight. And what are they doing? They're sealing the revolution. They're sealing it. I go to a priest, which Archie complained about it in 1990 before he died. They are telling me, they are telling me, said the archbishop, and even priests are telling me, my own priests, but Father so-and-so is very holy. Father so-and-so holds his fingers and thumb together when he celebrates the new Mass. Father so-and-so says the Latin Mass so reverently, and he also says the new Mass, and he is a very nice priest, and Father so-and-so is so holy. We are not complaining about Father so-and-so. We don't have a problem with Father so-and-so. We hope he's very holy. God bless him. He'll be taken care of by the angels and saints and judged by God when he dies. The trouble is, that new Mass is offensive to God. And the battle is, condemn the Novus Ordo Mass. Condemn it. And the battle is, condemn the heresies and errors of Vatican II. Do not shoot at straw men. Do not shoot at scarecrows. Don't shoot at the wrong weapon, the wrong enemy. And they're fighting the wrong fight. Many brave soldiers are going to fight the wrong fight. You shouldn't be in the parking lot of St. Isidore's, and you shouldn't be in the church of St. Isidore's, and you shouldn't be at the Mass of St. Isidore's. You shouldn't be there because they are not teaching the true faith as they are supposed to. That's why you shouldn't be there, because there has been a change of faith. And the change of faith is causing souls to go away from God. That's exactly what it's doing. And many good souls say, well, as long as I got my Latin Mass... And some are going now to the to whichever mass is closer. Many of our society people, well, there's ten people allowed at the society mass, so I'm not going there, so I'm going to the indult mass, where I can get in there. I'm going to the city Vicantus mass, where I can get in there. It doesn't matter so long as I get my mass. And there is a training going on. There is a training of the soul. If you've got internet, if you're one of the chosen people, if your name is on the list, you can get the mass. But if your name is not on the list, if you're not one of the chosen people, you can't get the Mass. We are not yet in the time where they're going to shoot us for celebrating the Mass. What did they do in those days? They told their fellow Catholics that the church is under persecution during 300 years. And you're put to death for being a Catholic under 300 years. And what do they say? I saw that soldier when he killed Anastasia... I saw him when he chopped off the head of Cecilia, that he had tears in his eyes. I think we can convert that soldier. Well, next week he's going to be walking down an alley by himself. Go and talk to him about the faith and tell him he can join our faith. And that it would be a great thing if he joins our faith. What about Morris? Morris is a Roman soldier. He belongs to the army that's going to defeat us. Tell him to become a Christian. Tell him to become a Catholic. And he did. And he converted all 6,000 of his legion. And 6,000 men converted to the Catholic faith. And then they were all killed for their faith. And they all laid down their arms and they all became saints. Because Morris said, I will fight the enemies of Rome. But I will not fight Rome. Our, our legion is tougher than any of the other legions. And if I take my 6,000 Catholics and fight against you pagans, we're going to wipe you out. You don't have a chance. But we will not fight against Rome. And therefore they laid down their arms and they became saints. We are being trained. Trained that the chosen people can go to Mass. The chosen people can go to church. And the ones that are not chosen, they cannot. Your mind is being formed by the devil right now. And what is happening? The souls are learning. They are learning very well. Well, my name is on the list. I know the priest. I've got special contacts. I can go to Mass. 
But if my name is not on the list, if I don't know the priest, I cannot go. Some churches are saying we don't want new people in the church, traditional churches. We have our own people to take care of, and we no longer have enough room even for our own people, so we don't want new parishioners right now. We, our own people can come for ten people and eight people. St. Mary's, Kansas, tomorrow they're going to have mass with social distancing, but today they're not, because tomorrow it's going to be opened up. Tomorrow on Monday, they're going to allow to have more people at mass as long as they keep six feet apart. But today they won't do it. It's only ten people in the church plus those people that are members on campus. And so... Now, what are they to do? You don't wait until tomorrow. The sheriff of Pottawatomie County said, I am not enforcing this stupid law. And that's in Pottawatomie County. And he himself said, I'm not going with this baloney. I won't enforce this baloney. I'm not sending my police officers out to arrest people and give out tickets to people for going to church. I'm not doing it. And even here in Colorado, there are, there are sheriffs that are saying, I'm not going to do it. There are officers saying, I'm not going to do it. If all the people went to church in St. Isidore's today, would they go and give them all tickets? Would the police and the SWAT team show up and the helicopters show up and they arrest everybody in church? No, they wouldn't. But what happens? There's a wrong fight. We're fighting for the wrong things. They should be going to church, period, anyway, but that's not the problem. Remember, the devil has many lies and many attacks. He's going to lie for everyone. We have the lie about the coronavirus. The virus is a pandemic spreading throughout the whole world, and it's very dangerous. If we quarantine, we're going to be okay. And others say the virus is so bad it's going to kill everybody on earth, but don't worry about it. And then others say every single kind of thing in between, and there's so many levels of lies. What are we to do? Follow the faith. Follow the truth. Stay with the church. Stay with the true church. Stay with the true faith. We don't play games with our holy faith. And many souls are being pulled away. And many souls are being deceived right now. Isn't it very encouraging? I'm really mad at this priest because he's not doing what he could do. I'm happy with that priest because at least he's trying to do something. But the good priest and the bad priest are not the issue. It's the good faith and the bad faith. It's the truth and the lie. What happens when you work hard for the, for the lie? If you have a good intention, you work hard for the lie, you still promote the lie. It is the truth that is the victory in our battlefield, and we must stand for the truth. And know this, as we're in this persecution right now, which will tank up and get worse. When the church comes back to its senses, which it will do by a victory, just like it did in, their, in, the, in those 300s, those men, Athanasius, when he was 25 years old, 26 years old, at the Council of Nicaea, he remembered the persecution. He remembered the bloodshed. Basil remembered the bloodshed. They all remembered in their youth, and there was a, such a change, all of a sudden, that religion which was wiped out, that religion was being wiped out and attacked, and was going to be eradicated in Rome. It became a Roman Catholic Church, and finally the principal church was in Rome itself, where it was supposed to be. And St. Peter's was constructed by the emperor himself. And St. Peter and, and, the, and the Pope crowned uh, Constantine and baptized Constantine inside that very cathedral, inside the city of Rome. And the pagan priests were very angry, and there was weeping and gnashing of teeth amongst those pagan priests. They were the advisors of the emperor, and now they are thrown aside, and they are out. And all of a sudden, the Catholics have taken over the entirety of the world. And the Catholics can take over the world again, and Catholics will take over the world again with the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But it will be Catholic faith, not a compromised faith, not a half-and-half -half faith. We have a very great evil going on when the priests and bishops and hierarchy of the church is trying to show to the wicked government, we are better than you. We will follow your regulations more than you follow your own regulations. We are going to show that we're better citizens than are the others. We're going to follow all your foolish rules and regulations without any question, even when you don't make them mandatory. We're going to follow, 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 and show you how good of a citizen we are. And when you see how good we are. And when you see how we follow all your rules and regulations, surely you will respect us, and surely you will love us, and surely you will come to our faith. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We cannot play the game of compromise of this double-edged sword, and the game of compromise has been played, and now it's played more and more, and we're being instructed how to become the elite, the false elite, the good guys.
I'm going to invite the good guys, but I'm not going to invite the bad guys. Our church is designed especially for bad guys. What did Jesus Christ say 2,000 years ago? And it was very offensive when he said it then. I have not come to save the just. I have come to save the sinners. I'm not saving people who are registered parishioners. I'm not saving people that are friends of the Padre. And they're, they're telling me now, those who have servers, if your child it serves at Mass, then your family can go to Mass with the child that serves. But if you're not a server, forget it. Not a server. If you're in the school, you get special privileges. But if you're not in the school, forget it. This is training pride, training an evil elitism, training the future Masons of the Church. That's what it's training. Those who are not good enough, those who are not smart enough, those who are not holy enough, they aren't allowed to come to our Mass. But our Lord Jesus Christ said, I have come for the sinners. I have come for the unjust. And that is what he did. And when he spoke his most beautiful words, it was when he was surrounded by publicans and sinners. And there is, and our church is designed to, be, to go and seek publicans and sinners. And also, as St. Bernard pointed out, note this about the fishermen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, we are fishermen, not hunters. When you're hunting for deer... A deer comes abroad, and it's the skinniest deer you ever saw in your life. His little, there's nothing. You don't shoot that one. You want the guy with 67 antlers. You want the guy with 67 points. You want the one that's 8 foot tall and weighs 793 pounds. That's the one you want. So you wait for the right one to come by, and you shoot that one. Fishermen don't do that. Fishermen take a net, and they throw it in the sea, and they pull up whatever comes. They throw a hook in the sea, and they pull up whatever comes. And then and the church is going after the souls, every soul in the sea. Not over only this kind of fish, not only that kind of soul, not only that one, and this one or the other one, but each soul is our object. And what is the spirit of the Catholic now? The Catholic traditional spirit is being destroyed and being turned into the spirit of the Pharisees. Beware of this temptation in our so-called coronavirus crisis, that we take on the spirit of the Pharisees, which is the spirit of Satan. Those that are good, those that are just, those that are worth it, those that have proved themselves, those that are connected, these are the ones we will invite, because after all, we don't have room for everybody. Don't worry, everybody won't come. <laughs> don't need to worry about that at all. They won't come. But the fact is, we want everybody to come, and if they do come, we'll do what St. John Vianney did. We'll do what St. John Bosco did. We'll, we will make room. That little parish in ours had over 100,000 visitors every year. And 100,000 visitors came to the small parish in ours. They made room. They made room. We will make room for all that wish to come. Especially the sinners, especially the weak, especially the foolish, especially the ignorant, especially those that have troubles in their hearts and troubles in their minds and troubles in their souls and who don't know all the answers. These are the ones we are after more than anyone else. And it is a very powerful, subtle, wicked, demonic attack to fight in a false way against this whole wickedness of these rules and regulations. We're gathering up people for parking lot masses. We're gathering up people to send petitions to the governor and, and to the state. We're going to make sure that we follow the rule perfectly. So we got you come into the mass. You come in. Everybody comes every, every hour slot. Forget about every hour slot. We're having mass in St. Mary's, Kansas. There's 5,000 people coming to mass. Arrest them. Start with a padre. We got 15 padres. We'll line them up one after another. Arrest the first one. Arrest the second one, arrest the third one, and make sure you got enough room in your jail. They're scared to death of the priest of God. They're scared to death of the bishop. They're scared to death of the truth. They're not yet ready to do it. And they haven't even threatened death yet. So what are we doing? We are combating in the wrong way. And we're being instructed by our enemies how to think. The new mass is not only a weapon for those that go to it, it was a weapon that turned the true mass into the, reason, into the only sign of faith. When the true mass is not the only sign of faith, Arius always celebrated the true mass. And you commit a mortal sin when you go to Arius' mass. He always celebrated the true mass. 
And, and uh, uh, the, the heretics and schismatics celebrated the true Mass. Luther continued to celebrate the Mass after he was, became a heretic. He, couldn't, he didn't stop celebrating the Mass. And Henry VIII went to the Mass regularly, and only the Latin Tridentine Mass. He could not stand the new Mass. So in between murdering wives and wiping out the Catholic faith and burning down monasteries and destroying the church everywhere and ravaging England... He went to Mass, so he must be holy. And it was the Latin Mass, and he liked the Gregorian chant. He burns in hell. And it was a Latin Mass that was celebrated at his death. And the prophecy of the first martyr, Saint, uh, with a, a three-letter word, Saint, Saint Abe or something like that, a three, just a very one English, one English, one syllable word. He said, you will die, Henry. And when you die, the dogs will lick your blood. And they did. Guess where they licked his blood? Inside of the cathedral. Inside the Westminster Cathedral, that's where they licked his blood. Because he stunk so bad that they couldn't stay next to his body. And they put his body in the cathedral because, after all, that's where the, that's where the king has to be buried. And, and his blood oozed out of the coffin, went down in the grave. The dogs came into the church, and no one stopped the dogs. And the dogs went to the blood of Henry VIII, and they drank his blood right before the Latin Tridentine Mass and the Libera Me and all the beautiful hymns. The beautiful hymns, the Libera Me, the Latin Tridentine Mass will not save your soul. It is the holy faith that saves the soul, and when the Mass is connected to those things, it greatly benefits and saves the soul. But if it is not connected to those things, it is a deception. St. Alphonsus himself said, How many souls, all good Catholic souls, are brought to the church, and they hear the Libra Me. Deliver me, O Lord. They hear, uh, don't know, <laughs> give peace, give, give us rest. Dona Ace Requiem, give them rest. But they receive no rest, and they are not delivered, and not one prayer benefits their souls, because they died the enemies of God. No external thing is going to save us. Our faith saves us. And so many times, so many times our ancestors, Athanasius never thought he would ever celebrate Mass in a visible church. Athanasius never thought he would stand before men publicly because he was born and raised in persecution. But then the church flourished. And there he was as a deacon at the Council of Nicaea. Standing in front of the emperor and standing in front of all the bishops who gathered together at that council. And then he went with glory into, this, into, into Nicaea to be a bishop. And no longer, no sooner was he made the bishop than the pope turns against him. And his fellow bishops turn against him. And they strive to kill him time after time. He was more safe from Diocletian than he was from his fellow bishops. And he preserved the church. He was the pillar of the church. And he preserved it from one generation to the whole 300, through the whole 4th century. He preserved the church by being a pillar of the faith. Marcel de Lefebvre preserved the faith church in the 20th century by being a pillar of the faith. Not just by celebrating the Mass, by joining priests who are supposed to know their faith, who are supposed to love their faith, who are supposed to carry that faith to the ends of the world. And the work of the Society of St. Pius X is the work of spreading the faith. It is not the work only of the Latin Tridentine Mass. It is not the work of liturgy. And right now we have a great attack of the devil going on. And remember that it's a two-sided attack. On the one side, how much fear are we ruled by? Everybody wearing a mask out in public. Don't do it. <laughs> They're all wearing masks to see who is a slave without being commanded. You're all going to be made visible slaves. But it's not enough to fight the battle of a mask. We're fighting the battle of the faith. One day they will come and put masks on us. One day they will come and put handcuffs on us. One day they will come and throw us in jail. But if we have our holy faith and we don't compromise our holy faith, we shall defeat the jail. We shall defeat the mask. We shall defeat the handcuffs. And remember, the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary is nigh, and Satan knows it. Just like around the year 302, he, he finally got Diocletian, who was the friend of the church, to turn into the enemy of the church. And he finally got Diocletian to unleash the most bloody persecution, because he could feel that his kingdom of Satan was about to collapse in Rome, and it did collapse in Rome. It did collapse. 
And Constantine the pagan was the one that made it collapse. And then he converted and was baptized. The modern historians aren't sure that he got baptized until his deathbed. But Sylvester was sure he got baptized. And the several hundred thousand witnesses in St. Peter's that watched him be baptized were sure he got baptized. And those bishops present at the Council of Nicaea, called by, by, by Constantine, they knew that he was baptized. And he, was, he held the faith, and he sent his mother over to Jerusalem to find the Holy Cross, which she found on this day, May the 3rd. And then for, for the for cross was found, and the miraculous cross of Christ was brought back to us. No one could deceive this possibility in the year 311. But within the next 10 years, all of Rome was changed, and it changed so suddenly. It happened then. It can happen now. We are near to a new Constantine who shall rise up. We are near to a new victory of the church, to the new fathers of the church. These fathers were born in persecution, studied in their ba basements, and then they were filled by the Holy Ghost, and they taught our holy church, they taught our holy faith, they began persecuted in youth, and they became bishops and saints of the church in that fourth century, and they went out publicly and spread the holy faith, and the greatest of them was Athanasius. The time of Athanasius is about to come again. And the time of the victory is about to come again. Don't play games now. Don't compromise now. Don't quit now. Let us stay firm in the faith. Stay firm in the truth. And not play games with it. And then our victory will come very soon. Closing, I bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.